Amata, the immortal Tamma. 7th February, 1976. While listening to a desana, please keep the jitta within yourself. Do not send it out to the various kinds of aramana, thoughts and imaginings. Don't cherish those aramana you have imagined and thought about in the past. This is of no benefit. At this time you should be trying to fill the heart with tamma. The heart has long been parched for lack of tamma. It is similar to a forest lacking in moisture where the vegetation easily ignites, scorching and consuming all the trees. There are seldom any forest fires in the rainy season, but the dry season always brings a danger fire. This also happens inside a forest monastery when it is very dry. Bantad Forest Monastery has caught on fire several times. This is due to dryness. When the heart becomes parched through a lack of tamma to cool and sustain it, then the fire of the Gelesas can rapidly take hold. Everything that comes into contact with it will be scorched without exception. Fire brings damage, so when the Gelesas are blazing within the heart, how could the heart not be harmed? Regardless of its value, it can't escape becoming stained and, in the end, totally worthless. Such is the way of the heart that has been constantly scorched and consumed by fire. A fire will damage our possessions depending on its intensity and extent. Unless, of course, they happen to be stored in a secure place, like a safe that a bank uses to protect its valuables. But do we have a safe place within our hearts, or are we always exposing ourselves to risks day and night in all our activities? Are we always leaving ourselves vulnerable, completely plundered and devastated? Don't we have any concern for our priceless hearts? We should use this way of thinking to teach ourselves. The heart cannot find any happiness, because the fire of the Gileases constantly burns it. This fire is the blaze of Raga, Dosa and Moha. Greed, hatred, and delusion, which is described in the fire sermon, Aditta Pariyaya Sutta. There should be no doubt or uncertainty about this, for this has always been true. If we just take up the various aspects of the Tamma explained in the suttas and carefully reflect on them using reason following the Tamma principles presented there, we will then be able to find a way of steering clear of this fire. We would then be able, from time to time, to find some peace and happiness without constantly being caught up in the conflagration. Each of you has made the effort to come here to practice. You are searching for a secure place to store your wealth, that is, the merit and virtue you have collected. You are searching for a safe place to protect them from destruction by those three great masses of fire. It's difficult to extinguish a forest fire. If it has really taken hold, then even water cannot contain it. To extinguish the internal fire of the Gileses, we must constantly develop and accumulate virtue. For example, Mitta Pawana, cultivation of loving kindness. This calms and concentrates the heart, making it capable of effectively subduing those harmful and injurious things, namely the fires discussed above. Speaking of fire, it must always be hot. Even flying sparks that fall on the body are hot and painful. If we allow ourselves to be burned constantly, day and night, what will we have left? The heart will be entirely burned out. What remains will be mere awareness, without any worth or value, since it has been totally given over to the all-consuming Gileses. It will be an awareness of Dukkha, not of happiness. It is not the awareness of wisdom. This awareness is overwhelmed by Dukkha, so much so that the heart appears quite useless. The consistent development of jitta pawana, mind development, by way of strenuous and diligent effort, is the way to extinguish the fire within the heart, gradually bringing peace and happiness. The Lord Buddha taught only those things that are within our capacity to achieve. Things beyond our ability he did not teach. All the tammas taught by the Lord Buddha are within the reach of Buddhist practitioners. The Lord did not teach blindly. We practitioners must therefore consider tamma to be of paramount importance and take it deeply to heart. Just as we shun and abhor all forms of dukkha, which no one wants, we must move in the direction of the cure for dukkha, which is tamma. When all this has been comprehended with reason so that we are committed to our practice by a firm conviction, it is not important whether the practice of tamma is easy or difficult. We can only do our best according to our capabilities. 
For who isn't lazy when under the power of the kilesas? This laziness, which loathes doing anything good or beneficial, is within each one of us. Laziness always takes the lead, but it certainly is not the tamma that will deliver us from dukkha. It's the main factor that makes us complacent and careless, gradually dragging us down following the power of the sly and deceitful kilesas. The Lord Buddha also experienced this, but he was able to transcend those things which had previously oppressed his heart. When we become weak and lazy, we should reflect on the Lord's experience and compare it with our own. By taking up his way as our ideal, we can gain inspiration for our own practice. Then we will be able to find a way to cope without always having to yield to the kilesas. Even though it's difficult, we can do it. When we acknowledge the truth of dukkha, the overcoming of dukkha then becomes crucially important. Otherwise, the problems that we detest and dread will always confront us. Without taking corrective action, it's just not possible for us to find a way out of this predicament. It does not matter whether a method is difficult or easy. As long as it is effective for uprooting undesirable things from the heart, we must use it. We are all equal in regards to birth and death, and the dukkha we have experienced in the various realms of existence right up to the present. Since we are all born and suffer from dukkha, we are equal in this regard. We have all been through repeated births and deaths, matching each other in the amount of suffering we've experienced. We have all suffered dukkha. There can be no competition among us concerning the number of lives we have gone through, since everyone has had so many. It is a similar story with dukkha, which is so abundant in our lives. Instead of us scoring high marks in the way of the jitta and tamma, we end up being foremost together in the way of dukkha. With the gelesas as the guide that leads us, we will always be led to more and more suffering. If we insist on trusting the gelesas, we will always experience suffering. If we don't resist them, we will never be delivered from this mass of dukkha. Resistance to the influence of the Gilesas is the way of Tamma. Tamma uses reason and analysis to understand the danger inherent in the Gilesas and to find the methods required to counter them effectively. We must utilize any means that's effective in overcoming the Gilesas to reduce the mass of dukkha. Whether those methods are difficult or easy is not important. This is like the way a craftsman uses his tools, some of which will be easy to use and others more difficult. He has to make use of them as the work requires. He must bear with the strenuous tasks as well as the lighter ones, as he gradually continues until finally accomplishing the required task. The tools we select for overcoming the gilesas and for developing a firm basis of wholeness and integrity in the heart all come from tamma. Tamma tools are varied and must be chosen to fit different circumstances. When the heart is only lightly disturbed by the gilesas, the strength of our resistance need not be so vigorous. For instance, the amount of time we spend doing sitting and walking meditation is not so important, because the task at hand has not yet reached a critical stage. But when our hearts are so disturbed by the gilesas that we can't unburden ourselves, then we cannot afford to remain idle and indifferent. We must exert ourselves to the utmost, even putting our own lives at stake, without any thought of surrender nor retreat. We must mobilize all of our satipanya and apply it to the situation, no matter how strenuous and arduous the task may be. We must persevere in our efforts, regardless of how severe the resulting dukkha may be. The dukkha brought about by our exertion is of little consequence when compared to the dukkha that the gilesas have heaped upon us. Once we are sunk in dukkha caused by the gilesas, there is no telling when we can emerge. We are all aware of the discomfort and pain experienced when sitting or walking in meditation for long hours. We are also aware of how difficult it is to devise the different means of coping with the various kinds of gelesa. But we are as yet unaware of the happiness and wonder that result from the hardship of our strenuous efforts. The transcendent experience attained through wisdom is precisely what we are aspiring and yearning for. Once the results follow the cause, which is our diligent effort, then any obstacle can be overcome. But should there be only difficulty and hardship without the reward of peace and happiness, then no one in this world would be able to continue. This does not apply only to ordinary people. Even the Lord Buddha and his Arahant disciples could not have become enlightened for us to take as a refuge. I take refuge in the Buddha and Thamma and Sankha. Eventually, the right time and opportunity will arise so that we can manage to succeed. 
Persistent effort is very important, as is the constant use of clear reasoning. As soon as our efforts weaken, the Gileases will grow more threatening and incisive. When our effort slackens, the Gileases will surge and swell. But if our exertion is intense, and our Satipanya are sharp and keen, then the Gileases will gradually fade away. This is because the Gileases are afraid only of Tamma and nothing else. Only Tamma can contain and subdue the Gileases. The Tamma of Satta, Virya, Sati, Smati, and Banya. Satta is the belief in the fruits of the Lord Buddha's enlightenment, and trust in the Tamma he expounded to the world as the Niyanika Tamma, the outward going vehicle, going out from Sansara, from Dukkha. This is Satta or conviction. If we only would practice following the Lord's teaching, then surely we too would realize those same satisfying results. Virya is diligent effort. Whatever task we do, whether internally or externally, when it is done with diligent effort, it will always be right and proper. When our work is supported by diligent effort, the results will always be well accomplished and pleasing to the eye. Sati is mindfulness, the important factor which oversees each task and prevents any negligence or error. Smati is firm resolution and commitment to the work at hand which guides it to its final completion, without distractions and unsteadiness. This is the causal aspect of Samadhi. The resultant aspect of Samadhi appears as stability and firmness of the jitta, leading to the experience of happiness and ease. This result arises from the causal aspect of Samadhi, that is, concentration focused on our work without wavering or vacillating. The resulting aspect of Samadhi is calmness of the heart, leading up to the state of Ekagata, which the Lord Buddha described as the mind being non-dual, because it has only one object. Banya is penetrative wisdom. Wisdom is the important factor used in observing and discriminating all circumstances that arise. The outcome of each task depends on the application of Banya, which investigates and analyzes everything. These are the factors of Tamma that will steadily lead us away from Dukkha, allowing us to complete any work we set out to do. The Lord Buddha said that the four ways to success, Ittibada, are of equally great importance. Tanda is satisfaction. What are we satisfied with? If we are satisfied with the Gileses, then the Gileses will come up. We are inclined to search for whatever delights us. Whatever we set our heart on will come up. However, the four ways to success do not refer to such base, corrupting influences, but to the virtue that can lead to the fulfillment of our aspirations. They are the four means to achieve those aims that lie within our reach. Tanda is satisfaction. Virya is diligent effort. Jitta is attentiveness and application to the work. Limangza is comprehensive wisdom. These four combine to form a single effective force for accomplishing our objectives. Indeed, this is the tamma that can build a complete human being. They can help develop a firm basis in the jitta by consolidating our efforts around true guiding principles, complete with excellent rules and disciplines, and good traditions and customs. This ensures that those who undertake the practice do not go counter to the principles of tamma. Once the heart is attuned to tamma in this way, it is safeguarded with the tamma protection, tammaraka. With tamma as its guardian, the heart will steadily prosper. Harmful influences will steadily decline. Regardless of how long the heart may have been down and miserable, it never reaches a state of complete destruction, because it remains capable of thinking and reasoning. Once the heart is cleansed through exertion, it will become bright, cool, and peaceful. This is the key, the essential factor that will turn our aspirations into full reality. Merely desiring success is not enough if we allow ourselves to be deterred by weakness and discouragement, which prevents us from pursuing and accomplishing our objective. Whatever we do, or however we think, we should never forget about the Lord Buddha, our Sasada, great teacher. Whenever we become weak and discouraged in any kind of work, we must reflect upon the example set by the Lord Buddha, who gained enlightenment through persistent effort, using Sadha, Virya, Sati, Samati, and Banya. How else could he become enlightened if not by these Tammas? With what are we going to develop and nourish our heart so it can excel and be at peace, so that we can at least be considered the follower of a teacher? The Lord Buddha explained his path of practice in a precise and orderly way, so this is the path we must follow. 
What gave rise to the phrase Thammang Saranangatami, I take refuge in the Thamma, if not these five Thammas of Sattha, Viriya, Sati, Samadhi, and Banya? It is just these five factors that arose with the Lord Buddha. The same is true of Sankhang Saranangatami, I take refuge in the Sankha. None of the Zadaka Sankha, regardless of their class or family background, whether they had been kings or merchants, rich or poor, were weak or easily discouraged. Once they had gone forth in the Buddha Sasana, they were characterized by their diligent effort. So diligent effort is an extremely important quality that will steadily uplift the quality of a person's heart. The five factors of Sattha, Viriya, Sati, Samadhi, and Banya can raise the heart and release it from the oppression of suffering. Once we have taken these five factors as our support, we are bound to progress steadily until we eventually free ourselves from Dukkha. The four ways to success are also factors that uplift the heart, preventing it from being oppressed and burdened. They never weigh down the heart. Some of the Savakas walked Jangama until the soles of their feet blistered. Think of that! Until their feet blistered! Is this striving or not? Some didn't sleep at all for an entire three months period. Venerable Takubala strove like that until his eyes ruptured, causing him to go blind. Did he suffer or not? Think how hard he strove. As for us, we don't need to strive to the point of ruining our body. If we could only make the Gilesas suffer, make them run and hide, this in itself would be quite commendable. Don't let the Gilesas swarm all over your ears and eyes, your nose and tongue, your body and heart. Once you are infested with the Gilesas, you will never be able to find the essence of Tamma within your heart. How then will you find any peace? We must rely on these Tamma principles to eradicate those Gilesas that remain dominant in our hearts. Don't cherish anything more than you cherish this Tamma. It is the tool that will overcome the Gilesas and steadily deliver the heart to the complete freedom which we treasure so highly. Which one is better, the heart that is free or the heart under the tyranny of the Gilesas? Which are better, people enslaved without any liberty were free people. As long as we are not weary of living under the power of the Gilesas, then we will always be submissive to them. But when we become tired of their domination and see the harm they cause, then we will strive to resist them by whatever means we can. Ultimately, we will have to rely on these five essential Tamma tools to entirely eliminate them. Where is the battleground for a practitioner? What do those who relentlessly walk Jangama and sit in Pawana day and night take as their battleground and object of investigation? The Lord taught the four Satta Tamma, noble truths, as the main principles of Tamma. These four Satta Tamma exist within the bodies and minds of people. We are also people, so when we walk in meditation and sit in Samadhi Pawana searching for Tamma, we must look for it in the noble truths. We already know about Dukkha, it arises in the bodies and minds of people and animals. Animals do not know how to remedy Dukkha, but we do. When Dukkha arises in the body, it is something truly undesirable. Even though the body may be normal and healthy, when Dukkha arises there will be uneasiness and anxiety. As the Dukkha becomes more severe, our demeanor will become even more unattractive and unsightly. Is the heart that is being afflicted with intense dukkha really worth looking at? Instead of alleviating the problem, our actions will tend to simply make matters worse. The idea that we can rid ourselves of intense suffering by using harsh words and offensive behavior is completely mistaken. In truth, the perpetrator hurts not only others with his outpouring of vile and offensive behavior, but he also increases his own suffering. Rather than getting rid of his problems, he merely increases them and spreads them about. We probe into the cause of Dukkha by asking how does Dukkha arise? This is one aspect of the Satcha Tamma. We may be aware of Dukkha, but we can't overcome it if we don't correct it at the original cause, which is Samudaya, the origin of Dukkha. What is Samudaya? It is comprised mainly of Gama Tanha, Pawatanha, and Vipawatanha. 
the Lord called them Samudaya. Desire for things we love and aversion for things we despise are the root cause of our suffering. Thoughts and imaginings based on the Gilesas all produce Dukkha, and so can be classified as Sumudaya. They all branch out from the same tree, which is the heart. Where are the true roots of greed, hatred, and delusion? They are all planted in the heart and nowhere else. First, we probe and investigate into the body. Then we turn to look into the heart, to find out what it is imagining and thinking about. The heart conjures up Dukkha day and night, causing endless trouble for us and for others as well. So the Lord taught us to use mindfulness and wisdom to investigate and scrutinize our thoughts. The mind tends to worry about the body. Why should it? There's always a cemetery waiting to receive it once its time is up. What can be achieved by all this concern and possessiveness? Will our anxiety bring any benefit? Won't it merely turn into yambi tang nalapatitambi dukkang? Unfulfilled desire breeds dukkha in the heart. So the Lord Buddha advised us to investigate the truth rather than indulging in our desires. Having been formed, the rupa kanta, the body, is destined to break up and disintegrate. We can see this irrefutably when we investigate with banya. It doesn't make any sense to be so possessive of the body. So we then let go our grasp and allow the body to follow its own nature. As long as it still holds together, we must realize that its very existence is inevitably heading for dissolution. This world is full of cemeteries awaiting the death of each person. If we investigate following the principles of Tamma, we will no longer be doubtful about our own death or about the place reserved for us in the cemetery. Once we acknowledge our mortality, we will not be shaken or upset. After seeing it clearly within the heart, we will relinquish death because it is a fundamental law of nature. We have to let nature take its course. Earth, water, air, and fire will follow their own essential natures. They are as they are. Let the one who knows know them truly and not mistake water, fire, and air to be self. Otherwise, they become parasites entangling the heart with affliction and anxiety. We mistake them for self and so fall into suffering. Ledana, feeling, is much the same. We have experienced sukha, happiness, and dukkha from the time of our birth to the present. Regardless of whether it's the sukha and dukkha of the body or that of the heart, they are all anitta, dukkha, and anatta. They all arise so as to pass away. They come into existence in order to cease. As long as they are samudhi, conventional realities, they cannot be permanent, stable, and unchanging. What is the nature of painful feeling? Bodily feelings are not difficult to investigate when wisdom penetrates them. The pain of the heart is more difficult to see, but it is especially important to investigate. When there is bodily pain, it is always accompanied by pain in the heart. This is the way that the Gilesos always fool people. The purpose of contemplating the body is to correct our delusion that the body is self. The investigation of Sukha and Dukkha Vedana is done for the purpose of eliminating from the heart the notion that this feeling is myself. Let things be as they really are. Feelings are one thing, the one that knows them is another. Do not mix them up. This is impossible anyway because they are intrinsically different. How can they be combined into one? For instance, can two people be combined into one? One person is enough of a burden, but to carry two or three or four or five people becomes extremely burdensome. We couldn't possibly go on like that. Having shouldered the burden of the body, Roba, we also take up the loads of Edana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vinyarna, which are pressed down by the weight of Upadana, attachment. It's the heart that must take the responsibility, so the heart alone must bear the consequences even though it has gained nothing from the attachment, and yet we still insist on clinging to them? We must investigate like this to see the true nature of pain. As for sanya, memory, what we remember is soon forgotten. When a memory is needed, we may recall it, only to have it fade away again. Sanya vasa vimuhati. That's how the Lord Buddha described it, and who can argue with him? Sanya is transient. Memory comes and goes. Sanya Anitta. The bhikkhus chant for the dead, 
anitta vata sankara, impermanent are all conditioned things. We chant this, and yet we imagine ourselves to be people because we take the five khandhas as ourselves. In truth, they are anitta, dukkha, and anatta. We must investigate using banya, differentiating and analyzing so as to see the truth completely in all its aspects. Don't be afraid of death. Death is not found within the jitta. By bringing up fear, you will only succeed in fooling yourself and piling up suffering. This is going contrary to tamma, which is the truth of the Lord Buddha. Whoever believes in the Lord Buddha must not go counter to the truth, but must investigate to see according to reality using the power of banya. One who does this is someone who truly takes up buddhang sarangatami. I take refuge in the Buddha, and does not just mouth the words. The Lord Buddha offered the Tamma to all living beings, so we too should be able to comprehend the Four Noble Truths. They exist within each one of us. Sankara means thought conception. Is it trustworthy enough to be believed when it conceives, imagines, and fabricates? It makes up various forms from various things. For instance, take the form of a doll, which eventually falls apart. Our thoughts are much the same. We may think about good or bad things, but they all become fabrications to fool us, because the jitta is the chief of fools. It is easily taken in by any deception. That's the way it is. Since it is easily taken in, it is victimized. But if we have wisdom to safeguard and carefully screen our thoughts, regardless of how many thousand times a second sankaras create concepts, then they will always be restrained. What can fool wisdom? It realizes that sankara is sankara and that knowingness is the heart. So how can we be deceived by them? Why be startled by our own shadows? This is precisely what sankaras are. It is the same with vinyarna, which flicks off and on whenever things come into contact with the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body, or are known by the heart. Then the jitta conceives and imagines using sankara and sanya allowing fabrications to arise and deceive us. We are constantly falling for our own aramana, mental objects, both day and night, and it is just this delusion that brings about lukkha. This is a consequence of being so deluded. If we do not see the harm here, where else can we see it? We will realize the truth of the satsatamma right at this point, so probe into it with great precision. The important thing is not how many times we go over it, but how clearly we understand it with wisdom. Then wisdom can pierce through any attachment. Even if it appears to be as big as a mountain, it will totally disintegrate. Once pursued by wisdom, craving will have to retreat into the big cave, right into the jitta. We must strike there with banya. Where is the real substance behind the shadows of Anitta, Dukkha, and Anatta? Drive on further. Their real substance is in the Jitta where they all gather. Apart from that, there are only shadows, delusions about Ropa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vinyarna. Once Banya has completely seen through these delusions, they will converge into the heart. At that point, we must be willing to follow them in and destroy them here, in their hiding place in the heart. When they are in there, they are like bandits waiting in ambush to shoot our heads off. Wherever bandits take up hiding, no matter how valuable the hideout may be, we must blow it up by throwing in explosives, destroying it all, including the bandits. If all must be obliterated, then so be it. We still have life and can build it anew for we did not die along with it. So we must hit hard so that the subtle kilesas all gather within the jitta. We must then investigate to see them all as a heap of anitta, dukkha, and anatta, because these kilesas are the essence of sammuti, conventional reality. After that, we must totally obliterate them from the jitta. Once they have been crushed and dispersed, we will see if the jitta has also been annihilated. But it hasn't because the jitta has no cemetery. The jitta, by its very nature, is amata, undying, even when it still has kilesas. 
The Buddha called this the complete dissolution of the Kilesas, the end of danger and the extinguishing of the fires of Raga, Dosa and Moha, greed, hatred and delusion, by the elixir of the Amata Tamma, immortal Tamma. With the Kilesas totally eliminated, only spotless purity remains. And there, in the perfectly pure Chitta, is where perfect happiness is found. All work comes to an end there. The Lord said, Vositang Brahmacharyang Gatangaraniya Naparang Etataya Di Padana Di. Done is the task, lived out is the holy life. There is no further work to be done. This is because perfect wisdom has been attained. This then is the end of Dukkha. This is where it finishes. The ultimate Tamma is found right here in this purified heart. The Buddhang Tammang and Sankang Saranangat Tami, to which we reverently repeat in our hearts, all converge into this natural state of purity. This state and the recollection of the Lord Buddha become one and the same. In their true natural state, Buddha, Tammo, and Sanko are just this absolute purity. The issue of the time and place of the Lord Buddha's Paranibbana, final passing away, is entirely settled because the true natural state of Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha now exists in the heart. This is the heart's priceless treasure. When the true state of things is seen, all questions are settled. Where did the Lord Buddha go when he passed away? His physical body merely disintegrated following its natural course, bodies being the same everywhere. But the purified nature, the complete Buddha, was not annihilated. It did not die. It transcends space and time. Such is the true Buddha. This is what we refer to in Buddhang Tammang and Sankang Saranangatami. How can this nature be annihilated? We must see it clearly within our own heart and use that to verify this nature once we have attained to a state of absolute purity. This will be the absolute proof. This is how all the Arahantsalvakas, enlightened disciples, understood the truth. Wherever they are, they are together with Tamma, with Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha, having audience with the Lord Buddha all the time, a galigo, timelessness. They will be unshakable because the elixir of the Amata, immortal Tamma, has totally quenched the fire of Raga Tanha, sensual desire, within their hearts, leaving no residue. Dei Sang Ho Ko The quelling and cessation of all Sankaras is supreme happiness. Once the Sankaras in the heart, Sankaras which are Samudaya, the cause of Dukkha, are entirely brought to an end, then we arrive at supreme happiness. The means and the results, the good and the bad, are within all of us who know and are aware. The nature that knows is uniquely suited to all levels of Tamma, up to and including the Visuddhi Tamma, which is the state of purity. There is nothing else apart from this knowingness. Please try to steadily purify this knowing nature, gradually ridding it of all oppressive influences. Then there will be no need to inquire where Nibbana is. Having arrived at the purified Jitta, all questions will finally be settled. <laughs>